a product with this this row here and that guy there. Um, they happen, you know, on each processor, right? So, um, but we can do that. So if we if we just ha imagine this this vector x is on every processor, no big deal, right? Then what we do is we just do these local matrix vector multiplications. The result is a piece of the answer, right? And then we have to do something like an all gather to concatenate this vector together um, and to get the result. Um, all right, so no big deal. That's that's not too bad. Um, so can someone maybe maybe say what's the disadvantage of this approach? Like what's what's one bad thing that we're doing here? Potentially bad thing. So the vector uh, A is uh, is copied to every processor. Vector X, I mean, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's definitely a bad thing. Um, so that's that can be bad. Why? Or if any processor can only work on work on one or several elements of sure, X, that's good. sure, sure. That, that's true. So that's exactly the reason why. So imagine, for example, let me let me show you one other approach to this, or actually two other approaches to this. Um, but um, but let's look at. Basically, what we could do if we didn't want all of X to be on every processor. Well, the second naive thing we could do, um, so X is not even on each machine, that's, that's the point, right? The second naive thing we could do is we could sort of strike the other direction, right? Um, so, how would this work? Uh, this would work uh, like that, right? But now um, we don't need all of X on every machine, um, so we position the columns. Um, so what we could do is we could basically you know, get the relevant pieces of X onto every onto each machine, right? So like each each of these four processors would read the relevant part of X, right? Um, and then they could do their um, their little matrix vector multiplies. Um, except now, um, but sort of they have a lot of little matrix vector multiplies to do in some sense, right? Like they or well, it's one one matrix vector multiply in the other direction, and when they want to get the results together, um, they're sort of not done yet. Right? Like in the other direction, the local work was sort of the answer, which had to concatenate together. Now we have some combination work to do. Uh, we have to basically reduce uh, the results on every processor. Right? So, um, so now we have um, these reduces with a small number of processors in some sense and a large amount of data. And we have a lot of them. Right? So we have to do one for every column, basically. Right? Uh, sorry, one for every row. Okay. So then, so what we would do is we would basically do a number of reduces, and then we would do a scatter to like get the results back there in the processor, right? Okay, so so far so good. We we have two different approaches to this. Um, so what is sort of weird about this one? This would be sort of obvious. Well, are you assuming that you're still voting over? Uh, let's not worry about it. it each column of A you store is as big as the X. That's right, yeah. So so if we couldn't store X on every machine, we certainly can't store in these columns like this, right? This is sort of weird, right? So so really what we want to do is we want to have this situation where we have a matrix partitioned into blocks. Right? This would sort of be, in some sense, this is sort of the ideal for memory usage. You can get sort of the, intuitively you would expect to get the the most scalability out of a matrix vector product would be like this one, um, at least for appropriate sizes of matrices and processors. Um, so we'll assume, for example, like we have a square number of processors, right? Um, all right, so, um, so each block here is now going to be a process, right? And we want to do this matrix vector product. So now we have, we've sort of combined these two approaches together. That's the, at least the direction we want to go down. Okay, so what does it what sort of makes sense? Um, well, imagine that we color the um, we color the, the vector x like this, right? So that the the, the processes on the diagonal, like the red processor has the red piece of data, the green processor has the green piece of data, etc. And suppose we want the answer to be similar, right? So we want the, the results to be on these diagonal processes as well. Um, so so what can we see? Well, um, what we can see is that we have to do two different things, right? 
on one hand, um, we need the data itself to be striped like that, right? Like all the red data has to be replicated up and down the column and so on and so forth for all the other colors, right? But the results of the multiplication should be reduced in the, of these little local multiplications to be reduced in the other order, right? So we have sort of striping going on in both directions. Um, so the, the first thing isn't too big of a deal if we, did, we, can, if we could just broadcast up and down the columns. The last thing isn't too big a deal if we can reduce across the rows. So, right, so, okay. So what is this really telling us? We're, clearly it's telling us that what we need is we need a way of having little communicators, uh, one for rows and one for columns, right? So, um, cool, so how do we do this? So we need a separate communicator for each, column processors and uh, row analysis. So, so of course there's a command for it, something like this, like not exactly what I just said, but there's a command to get you a new communicator. So given an old communicator and something called an MPI group, what you can get is a new communicator. All right, so, um, so of course old communicator is the original communicator. Um, the group, uh, which is sort of the important thing here, is, uh, is represents at least uh, ethereally um, a subset of ranks from the old communicator. So it's, a, it's sort of a list, if you will, of ranks in the communicator. A new communicator is obviously just a new communicator. And it's composed of only the processes in the group that, that we get. Okay. And so in this new communicator, and in any new communicator, all of the ranks will be re-indexed. So you could have processors 2 and 3, for example, in a sub-communicator, but they'll be now called 0 and 1 within this new communicator. So their ranks sort of change. So, um, so obviously the, the focus for this right this moment is what what is one of these MPI groups, um, right? So, oops. yeah. So it's um it's something that you can create with or you can get access to for a communicator from with this command. So, uh. Given a, given a communicator, I can get access to the underlying groups. In other words, for every communicator, there is a group. Um, so given, given a communicator, I can use this command to get the corresponding group. Um, and groups themselves, you should just think of as sets. Sets of numbers, sets of integers. Right? And so because they're sets, you can do normal set arithmetic on them. So we have all of these operations. Uh, so we have... Given a group, we can get um, its size, and if, and if you're a processor and you're looking at a group, you can determine if you're in the group, and if so, what your rank is, by calling MPI group rank. Um, so then, of course, given two groups, we can union them, we can intersect them, and we can take the difference of one from another. All right, so that's fine. Of course, this doesn't really, this is sort of like a weird way of defining groups, because um, it suggests that we have to take a group, right, and then we can take other groups, and we only have one so far though, and we can somehow combine them together to get new groups. But I haven't told you how to get anything other than the group for MPI Com World, <laughs> right? So, so far all of this is a bit nebulous uh, and useless. So of course these last two commands help us do that. So given a group, we can exclude an array of ranks from that group, and we can include an array of ranks into the group and get a new group. Um, and so that's what these last two commands do. Um, all right, so let's let's try and apply what I've just shown you to our matrix vector multiplication. At least attempt to start applying to our matrix vector multiplication. Oh, I should say one other thing. Um, so this com create call, uh, which was back here. Um, so this is a blocking operation. So this is a collective blocking operation. It's maybe not clear at first why that needs to be, but um, what this means is that all of the processors in the old communicator must enter this new, this comp create at some point if all the processors are to leave it, right? And even if they're not in the new communicator, right? Just to sort of give permission to their friends to leave their group or to sort of join a new group, right? They have to, they have to call this comp create, all right? So, so let's look at let's look at this example code. 
So again, I'm going to assume you have the sort of standard header of getting a combo of rank and size and so on. Um, and I'm going to further assume that the number of processors that we have is, uh, is a square number. So it's like P and P is over Q squared. Uh, so like 4 or something, 8. Right, so, so what this little code here is going to do is it's, it's going to do something like this. It's going to say, all right, I'm going to have in a row, I'm going to have um, so you have processes that I'm going to call 0 to Q minus 1. Right? Let me you know, define uh, the group that I, I want to represent the group world, the com world, and the first real group, uh, and the first, uh, the first row communicator. I'm going to create these three things, and my goal here is just to create this object. Right? And so I only want to do this in some sense, well, okay, so I already have a bug in this code. Um, I, I really only need to do this if I'm, my rank is less than Q, of course, I have to do this com create here, sort of no matter what. Um, so this is actually a bug. I should delete this if statement here. So every processor would need to do this, um, right? Um, and what would it do? Well, it would just basically create a list of integers um, that are labeled 0 to Q minus 1, right? Um, build a communicator out of it. So basically take Basically, here's what this is going to do. This is going to take the process, uh, processes in group world, right? And it's going to take the processes labeled 0 to Q minus 1 in group world and create a new communicator out of them. So that's how this works. So group include, uh, contrary to what I just alluded to before, what it does is it takes the, the set of numbers in this array um, as a subset of this communicator and creates a new group out of them. Or sorry, sorry, it's a subset of this group and creates a new group out of them. And then we call concrete, and of course you create a communicator that you now communicate. When you call concrete, um, do you automatically exclude those new ones uh, from the old group? Or no? No. The old group stays the same. It's just like you're now you're sort of identifying a subset that are going to talk to each other. Um, sorry. So, so of course, let me just remind you. So this is a typo. So this if statement shouldn't be here. This if block should just be just line three and line fifteen should just be deleted. If this wants, if you want this to actually run without deadlock, so um, okay. But it gets to the point. Why was I writing that if statement? What was I thinking when I wrote that? I was thinking, well, you know, gee, you know, this is just the first one, right? I have to do a number of these, right, for all the different rows, right, and all the different columns, right. And it's going to be a massive headache because because further, you know, it's all blocking, right? So. All the processors have to do all the same things in order, independent of their their needs in terms of communication. Right, so this is sort of frustrating. This the sort of low level, if you will, of building communicators is sort of frustrating. Right, we'd like to be able to do things with, like a little bit more intelligently. Um, all right, so um, so this this is, this is the issue. Concrete is a blocking and collective operation. Um, and, and this code, while straightforward, um, is not simple or short, <laughs> right? Um, it's also very error prone. So as you can see, I, I've written a bug <laughs> without trying, right? It, it'll be very easy to write bugs just in this sort of style of writing software. Um, all right, so, um, so how can we do this a little bit better? So one way to do this better is to use this, this other routine called MPI com split. And so like the other, like comp create, uh, all the processes must execute this little bit of code um, in order for anyone to return. So it's still a blocking collective operation, but um, we're going to get a little bit more mileage out of it. So how does this work? Um, basically, all the processors are grouped by their color um, and assign their rank based on their key in the new community. All right, so this works when you're going to, when a call to comp split is going to partition the original unit. So as long as you can engineer this so that all the, well, you can always basically engineer something so that all the processes can know which group they want to end up in. Um, so you can almost always use this comp split uh, for something like partitioning in this, in this nice way. Um, so when you want to take a communicator and partition it into pieces, this is, this is a really convenient way to do it. Um, so as I'm illustrating here, we can basically do some little bit of arithmetic. So, so, uh, so if you're an assembly instruction uh, fanatic, and you'll realize that in fact this is one line of assembly between both these divisions, 
Um, and then, not that it really matters, I suppose, but, uh, and then you call this comp split twice, once for the row, once for the column, um, and then you group all the processors. So the result of something like this would be the row communicator and column communicator. Does this make sense to everyone? Right, so, so again, I should say that, so this is, these are both, you know, blocking things. So this actually takes time, running time, and you can time how long these things take. And you can time doing, like, like actually for one, one of the first projects I ever wrote in MPI, I, I didn't know about comp split, so I was trying to do the other thing, and I was trying to, like, you know, make all these crazy logic that would generate all these various communicators up front on the code. And it was super slow, you know, I was spending, like, an hour or something, like, just to create, you know, these communicators, literally, like, an hour of compute time, just to, you know, create all these various communicators. And then I, I realized I could just organize it all with comp split, and I went from, like, an hour to, like, a couple seconds. So it was, it was pretty nice. So, so, so this is sort of a nice command to use. Um, all right, so let's look at how this would kind of get get used on, on our example program, so on our matrix vector multiplication. Um, so what we would do is we would you know initialize get rank and size and get our local copy of A, right? And then we use our split here that I was just showing you. This is the same, pretty much the same code to get our row and column communicators. Um, we, get our, we get our new ranks now within um, each of these two communicators. And then basically what we can do is we can say, we can just basically enter a broadcast where if we're on the diagonal, that means we have the vector x, or at least we can access it from this library call, right? And then we can broadcast it to the rest of the people, right? Uh, otherwise, we can just receive, we can basically receive from the broadcast. Um, so if we're on the diagonal in the, in the column communicator, which I just sort of wrote in this little pseudocode here, yeah. um, then we can do that, which this is a pretty easy thing to check. Um, and then we can do our local major spectrum multiplication, because now we have the appropriate data, right? And then we just call an all reduce on our row communicator. And we're done. Right, so, so 30 lines of code, not too bad to do a distributed major spectrum multiplication. Feels pretty good. All right. So, any questions about this? I didn't get why it's more efficient than just simple first ID bar pro multiplication than just the vector. Sorry? But I didn't get why it's more efficient to complete the two. Like it seems like very simple now with the process and communicators. So as opposed to what? This this versus what? This is first of all, it's a row distribution. Oh, I see. So the problem is just that um, potentially you can't still store. We can broadcast the vector, right, to every processor. And I'm sorry. We still can broadcast the x vector to every processor. So, so this x. So, sorry, let me be a little bit clear. So this x is not the entirety of x, right? Just one little piece of x. Yeah, but you have a cost of multiple communicator grouping and stuff. So these communicator costs are very small, right? Um, these two communicators, you can time how long this will take. Okay? Since you're asking, I'll put it on your homework. Right? Uh, so to just, just see how long something like this takes to, to run. Just have a feeling for it. Um, so this is massively fast compared to everything else you're going to do. Right? In fact, this is going to be basically constant time right? compared to uh, all the rest of this work. So imagine, imagine now that each of these little, little matrices here are, in fact, like on the order of the amount of memory you have on the system, right? So you can you can definitely fit a little piece of X in there, but maybe not, you know, the whole the whole the, 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 matrix, the vector X, right? Um, and um, you know you can do these these map facts with no trouble, right? These little things, right? But you just couldn't do it, you know, at all, right? If you if you did it the other way, right? if you tried to stripe across the whole matrix, it may be impossible, right? To to store that much data. So it's not so much about efficiency either. So, so you know, it might be possible that, okay, it certainly will be the case, right, that if you didn't have to do any communication at all, right, then your, your matrix structure multiply will be much faster. This presumes, right, that you can fit it all into memory. Right? So you may not be able to do that. So right now, if I understand correctly, we're just multiplying the vector by the diagonal. 
Where, so what, oh, what, sorry. What, uh, we're, yeah. we're multiplying what with what and adding what to what. So what, oh, sorry, so let me yeah. explain this. So, so you have this vector x, right. right? And what I'm saying is that it happens to be stored on the processors that are represented by the DAG, uh -huh. right? Um, it can be represented anywhere, but I'm, happy to, I'm just making the point of saying that it's on the DAG. Okay, so, okay. so far we have passed the diagonal to each processor. Right. So, this, so this bit of code here, this broadcast, right. is going to broadcast the data that represents like this thing, right? right? Up this column, this guy, up this column. Okay. Right. Right. So that all these guys have it, right? Okay. right? So now each of these guys has gotten a copy of the little piece of uh, vector that it needs, right? But it, but it hasn't received the entire, it hasn't done that by receiving the entire thing and taking the piece. So we've communicated just the information we needed so far to the people we need to communicate to. Right, so no one's received any information that you haven't needed to receive. Right. But, but then, suppose that you, uh, so your first assumption that we cannot store this tree, and, but at the same time, you're supposed to allocate as many processors as the length of this tree. Right? So it's fine to allocate as many processes as you need because you can keep building your cluster larger. Right? But that doesn't mean that, that one machine, doesn't mean that any one machine on the cluster can access the memory and all the other systems. Right? Just imagine I take your laptop and I duplicate it 10 million times. Right? So one of your laptops, I give you 10 million of your own laptop, right? right? So one of your laptops can only access the memory in the motherboard, right? In, the, in, its, in its hardware, right? So it needs to do this communication in order to get the other memory. And it, it may not be feasible, right, to build, to take all the memory from all those machines stick it in one computer, right? So, uh, so it, sometimes this is sort of necessary for large enough problems, right? And I, and I agree with you that, you know, in some sense it's sort of unnecessary if your matrix fits in the RAM of one system, right? So for physical problems, they might use block as a, like a fix of matrices, right? Uh, like this, these little blocks might be really large. Yeah, yeah of course, yeah, exactly. Um, right. Cool. So, make sense? Happy? Great. Um, okay, so, new problem. Um, I promised two people that I, on the email that I would talk about matrix vector multiply, and I've sort of done that now. And I also told someone that I would at some point mention differential equations. Um, so, so, suppose you want to solve a differential equation, but you know you want to do this in distributed memory. And I should say, I'm not someone who likes to solve differential equations. I don't really do it ever. So if I butcher this conversation about what actually happens when solving differential equations, I apologize in advance. But I think this should give you a flavor for sort of how this might go. So uh, I found this picture on the internet. Um, so this is, imagine you have a 3D problem. So your domain is a 3D thing, right? And um, you move forward in time somehow with this P. So you have a has four dimensional set of data, right? So your initial data would be data at every point in the grid. And you have boundary conditions initial, and that'll be initial data, then you have boundary data, right, potentially, and then you move forward in time. Um, so what ends up happening is that because you have this grid, your PD requires a grid style communication. Right? So what do I mean? I mean that if you're some, I mean, it's hard to point to 3D, but like if you're some, like any place in this grid here, right, then the, the value at the next time step um, in the, at, at that position is going to be a convolution or a linear combination, if you will, of stuff in a stencil around, like in a local neighborhood of the point, right, in, in R3. Right, so you take all the values around that point, including potentially that point, you do some arithmetic on them, you get some new number, that new number gets stuck in the point that you, you care about, right? So it makes perfect sense to want to divide up your 3D area here into sort of cubes, right? So like partition it by cubes, right? And then most of the points, you can do this just fine. The only problem is, is that when you get near the boundary, um, you know, a point on the boundary, you know, it's, it's a neighbor is on another processor, right? So there has to be some swapping of data in order for this to make sense. So, um, 
Does anyone appreciate already, as I'm saying this, how complicated this might be if you were to just try and do this? <laughs> okay. Uh, if not, I'm going to try and impress about just how, just how hard, hard this might end up looking. <laughs> Uh, this is actually, I don't think this is a 3D problem, I'm sure. this is still only a 2D problem, although I could be wrong. Uh, this is a, a friend of mine sent me this code from something he did once. Um, so this is what you would do, this is a, a little bit of code here that's actually a subset of all the code you need, just to set up the fact that you have a grid. What? Okay, and then, and then once you have this grid, and you've called MPI and you've done the appropriate communication uh, communicator business to you know, get, get a communicator, right? You'd have to locate sort of yourself in the grid, and you'd have to be very careful on the points on the, the boundaries, and sort of which boundaries they're on, so that you can worry about, can I go in this dimension plus one, or that dimension minus one, or you know, so on and so forth. Right? So you can imagine that, that there's a lot of you know, work involved in just sort of like dealing with that. But if you're not done yet, you still haven't done any work, you just set up what you needed to set up in order to sort of do work. Right? And then you have this large, branchy code here um, to do this, the send and receive pairs between all the different processors. Um, so this is sort of the kind of stuff that happens. Um, so, um, so, there's, oh, so people want to see that again. <laughs> appreciate like just the, and that's like this is all a subset of the code that I was pulling out. Just do a simple like heat equation or something. Right, so this is really not a lot of fun. So uh, there's many edge cases, as I was saying. Um, and there's an alternative to doing all this, of course, or else I'm going to tell you how terrible this is. I'm telling you to get over it. <laughs> uh, which is this this MPI cart create uh, API call. All right, so. A lot of parameters to this. So it takes, of course, an old communicator, um, but, but there's some other things. Uh, so this is the number of dimensions of the grid. So I can build a, uh, you know, instead of a 3D grid, I can build a 4D grid or, or a million degree, million D grid if I wanted to. Um, code is obviously agnostic to this. Um, and this array here tells me in each of these, say, million dimensions, Right? How many grid points, how, many, how much evenly spaced grid points do I want? How many nodes, cluster nodes across these dimensions am I going to have? Um, so somehow um, the product right, of all of these numbers had better be the number of processors, if, or at least you might think of as being the number of processors, let's say it that way, um, that you're dealing with. Um, OK, so then the next one is a little bit strange. So. So far, um, if I kind of, in some sense, if I filled all the rest of this with default values, what I get is uh, an honest to God grid like I just showed you on this picture. Right? So you can use like like three for this parameter, and then however many are here and here and here to do that, right? But but I guess um, I guess so. What you could do is you could, you could you know, I don't know if anyone studied topology, right? But what you can do is you can take the endpoints of a grid and you can say, well, I'm going to take you know, this side, the right side here, and I'm going to adjoin it to the left side. Or I'm possibly going to adjoin it to the left side, but I'm going to rotate it first. Right? So then you can get tori, Klein bottles, and Mobius strips, um, all sorts of interesting communication patterns. I don't know of any uh, non-torsion free spaces like all these strips and Klein models never have any real application in reality, uh, but um, but you can you can code it nonetheless <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, if you try to find that that's necessary for whatever reason, solving a PD on Mobius strip or something, then I guess you can do it. Um, all right, and so then this is reorder business, um, and so what is that? So um, this is actually just really a pool. Um, it's either zero or one. And if it's a one, you're giving MPI permission to apply a permutation to the ranks of the processors that it takes from uh, old communicator. And why might you do this? Uh, because MPI is sort of very lazy, right? So when you give it a group, let's say the group has the processes zero, one, and two. Or, well, yeah, let's just say there's zero, one, and two. Or, or maybe a more interesting example, two, three, and five, so they're not continuous. Um, 
what it'll do is it'll assign processor 2 to be rank 0 in the new communicator, processor 3 to be rank 1, and processor 5 to be rank 2. Um, so it just basically sorts the numbers in the group, and then it assumes that you just assign an order. Uh, except in reality, of course, this could be fine, right? Except in reality, the communication that's going to happen, right, is not necessarily like, like you know, many times the, the, the actual processors that are communicated, like this guy would communicate to that guy. It, it may just work out that because of the abstraction that we work at here, um, that these two processors are actually nowhere near each other on the network. You know, maybe these two processors don't have a direct physical uh, Ethernet cable between them. Maybe there's a number of pops they have to go through. Right, but um, but maybe it wouldn't be so terrible if, uh, and this is kind of symmetric, but maybe this guy and you know some guy far away um, were, were permuted such that they that they like didn't have to talk to each other really. Yeah, does that make sense? Like if, in other words, you're physically you have computers with network, right, and you really like it to be the case that the things that are adjacent to you on the network are adjacent to you on the screen. Right, so that when you do your communication, you actually talk to people that are physically nearby you, like in real life, right? Um, so this reorder parameter is giving permission to MPI to do this reorder. It's saying that you don't, you know, it, it might be like a, one, one time maybe said the true would be if you have no clue what the topology is like, and you'd like MPI to just sort of take care of you to the best of its ability. Of course, maybe you know something about the topology. Maybe you can beat MPI and do something better than its algorithms. But this reorder, what happens on this reorder is implementation specific, right? And it sort of doesn't matter if actually if physically every node is connected to every other node. Um, so, for example, if that was your topology, you may set reorder to zero so that you don't waste time doing this permutation application, right? Um, but if but if usually computers uh, computer clusters are not a graph, usually there's, it's either something like a torus, or it's something like a, what's called a fat tree, which is like a bunch of computers all connected together, but in one node, each of them connected directly to another group of processors. You know, like all of like a fat tree structure. There's like a binary tree, but each node is like a, a clique of little computers. Um, all right, so so this is card three, and too much information about what actually happens in clusters. Um, so the point is, is that when you're done doing this, you can use, the, the, like, you're, you're like, why do I care about this thing? This returns a communicator, right? Um, the point is that it creates a, this this call creates a number of, of MPI uh, internal structures that allow you to basically index processors instead of by numbers, by vectors of numbers, right? So instead of an integer, say, you now can you can now access processors by vectors in RN, right? So I can take a processor and I can add. 0, 1 to it and go that way, right? Right, that's sort of the idea. So how does that work? Um, that works by um, this call to MPI Cartesian coordinates. So it looks like this. Given a communicator um, at a rank in that communicator and the number of dimensions of the, co of the coordinate system, um, I return to you uh, the vector in, in Z and dims corresponds to this processor. All right, so far so good. Um, but we can do a little bit better. So, so of course, this is the opposite thing. Ooh, I, that's a typo. It's not cart create. It's um, MPI cart rank is the name of this uh, call. Um, so given a set of coordinates, you can, of course, get the number back. So this is the opposite call. Um, but there's something even cooler. So what you can do is you can say, given a direction, like you call this on a processor, given a direction you want to move, um, like, in, in, like say you want to go up, right, so you put direction, you know, to the, the axis of up, right, and so it's zero, one, or two, let's say, in R3, um, and then display says how far you want to go in that direction, um, <coughs> then what you can do, with, and then you, you give it just the source and destination pointers, and it will return to you um, the rank for you and the rank for the destination, right, so pretty sweet, and then you can do basically linear algebra on your ranks. So you can do this in all the coordinate directions, and you can build linear transformations just on your ranks. You can do linear algebra just to compute who you can communicate to. Um, so that you can get very elaborate with calls like this. I build a little three by three matrices and rotate them and apply SVDs to them. Anyways, um, so this is what these things do. 
Any questions so far? Great. And dimensional magnitude. Yeah, in general. I mean, usually people use this for like three dimensional fields, but. But that also only applies for continuum fields. So if I have like non-structure, non-structure, like geometry. Yeah, so that's a good point. So, you can, well, I mean, strictly speaking, it doesn't care too much, right? Like, you can, if you want to put an octree, for example, on your on some data set, you have its own structure, as an example of such a thing, right? Your tree itself can still, in some sense, be represented as a Cartesian grid, right? But you don't necessarily care about the particular choices in the coordinates. Right? What you care about is, oh, so I should say, there's one call that I, I didn't put on here. Um, that would be critical to doing some such a thing. So there's one called MPI cart sub. Um, and I forget the precise parameters, but you can look them up. But I'll tell you later. Um, and what sub does is takes a basically takes a Cartesian grid like this and creates another Cartesian grid inside of it based on like the points in the original. Right. So um, so you can like subdivide these grids further and further. Um, so uh, yeah, so so that you can still kind of do these unstructured creating things with one of these, but you get extra structure that you sometimes don't care about. And maybe sometimes you can't use this, but um, but there's actually um, I should say there's also a whole other set of things in the library that we're not going to talk about, um, which is called MPI graph create, right? And so instead of using a Cartesian grid, so this thing is really a, an instantiation of the graph system where you can actually create arbitrary graphs, undirected graphs, right? And, or I think you may possibly even direct it, that's not sure, right? Um, where every node is now a processor and we have arbitrary edges coming out. Um, and, and there's a whole system in the API that are practicing that stuff. Um, off the top of my head, I don't have a good example of why you'd ever want to do that, but, but I, I'm sure there is a great one because you know, they wouldn't create it really unless it's someone who's using it. Um, all right, so, um, this is a good appropriate time to briefly just say. Uh, so the next homework will be available pretty soon. Um, and of course, we'll like ask you to play around with a lot of these, these things. Um, so I don't have an exact time, hopefully sometime this week on the homework. Um, so you guys can do it before the class ends, basically. But, um, uh, but, but it'll help you use these commands. Um, all right, cool. Um, So the rest of the class, I'm going to switch gears back to the, the second one, um, which is MPI data types. Um, so before we do that, are there any questions about what we've talked about so far? So I guess this card create thing, so you're, you're creating like a 3D grid of both like literal points in, on each processor and also a grid of uh, processors. Yeah, you can do what you want with them. But I, I mean, I, I think that a convenient thing that you use them for, what, what makes it sort of useful, is that you can create a grid of processors. Like, like for this for this code here, I might create a 3D grid where every big box here corresponds to a processor, right? Um, and then I can I can tell it, okay, now I need to move to the left, I need to move to the right. Oh, there's one really really important thing which I was going to write, I forgot to mention. Um, so. There's boundary cases. Imagine that you don't do any wrapping here, right? Imagine you don't have periodic boundary conditions, for example, right? Um, so uh, this guy, it would send and receive on this on this this, this boundary here, the end of the page, um, to no one, right? It wouldn't it wouldn't have anyone to send and receive to. So it's really inconvenient from the standpoint of writing clean software because if you imagine the symmetry like your if else blocks, your send receives. Um, you have to handle a special case when you're just that processor. Um, so, to make this sort of nice, there's a there's a processor ID um, called MPI proc null. Um, so, what MPI proc null is is it's obviously a null processor, the non-existent processor. Um, and when your process tries to send something to it, it just doesn't do it, right? So it just returns immediately. The proc null call. So this is convenient for writing code because now you can, you can be you know, avoid a branch, basically, is the point. Uh, so it cleanly returns from this. Um, in fact, uh, an optimizing compiler would, would omit the call entirely from, from your code. This is a very good idea to do something like this. Um, 
So you avoid a branch and you draw a call to ascend or receive. Um, all right, so cool. So with that, we change gears. So this is a brief review from the last time we talked about data types. Two lectures, three lectures. Um, two lectures. So, um, so far, we know how to send types like this. Uh, right, so, so these are all the types that we have. And the last one in Kai Byte, we remarked, was really good if you have contiguous data all the same type, or at least if, even if you don't know that it's all the same type, if you can somehow compute the length of your contiguous data in bytes, right, then you can use this last one sort of as a catch-all for many, many contiguous sets of data. Um, what do you have this list of? I was just wondering, is there any effective difference in how MPI handles your data versus uh, MPI byte versus MPI car? Uh, good question. Uh, probably not, because they're the same C data type. Yeah, that's why I um, I don't know. But, um, I mean, by definition, a character is in, like, in C, the, in the C yeah. spec, right? A character and a byte are the same type. Right. Just for readability. Yeah, I think it might just be readability. Yeah. Prob probably not, is my, my guess. Probably no difference. Um, all right, so, cool. So, it doesn't even make sense. What, what could they be different from? Nothing. Yeah, that's why I wonder why there's two of them. Yeah. So, yeah, I don't know why. That's a good question. Just probably the readability, I guess. But okay, so so here's the question. So how about a struct, right? How do I send a struct? Um, okay, so imagine I had a struct like this, right? This is really pretty natural. So so a struct. So does everyone know how a struct in C or C plus plus is defined? Like what it is as a as an object in memory? Here. It's perfectly acceptable to say, no way, no way, Jose. Um, all right, so it's, it's usual that people don't understand how some of these things work. Let me explain. So what a struct is, so there's actually some history here that I'm going to forget a little bit of, but there's other things besides structs that look a lot like structs. One of them is called a union. Um, so the, the word union here is maybe a bit more like illustrative of what this actually is. What it does is it takes these three things, both A, B, and N, um, it assigns in memory an amount of space equivalent basically to the size of a float plus the size of another float plus the size of the int in that order, in the order specified in this instance. So if I flip um, these things around, it, it allocates memory, it allocates the same amount of memory, but potentially put it in a different way. And, and in fact, um, it's actually not the case that if I always flip around data types like this, um, that I'll always get the same amount of information out of struct reason why is that um, uh, it's, it's hardware specific, it's highly hardware specific, it's actually microarchitecture specific, but it depends on the hardware's requirements on padding of types. So basically there's something called alignment, so you can, so processors can only actually address uh, things in byte aligned amounts, um, so 8-bit aligned, there's something called 8-byte aligned, only 16-byte aligned, I forget exactly how it works, but um, so sometimes you can flip these around and the alignment gets messed up and you add a little bit more padding at the end of the structure. <coughs> but so, um, so imagine we wanted to write code like this. Right? So imagine we wanted to create one of these in data types um, called in data, and we wanted to broadcast it across our compiler. Um, so you know the reasonable thing to do would be to try and hand this, this type here, right? Of course, of course this, this is invalid C. Uh, why? Because C defines that a parameter, so, or at least it, it could compile, but it probably won't. Um, a good compiler will probably, will probably complain for doing this. Um, and error. All right, so, so why is this invalid? It's all about this, this obviously this thing here. Um, so the point is that a parameter to a function can only be um, an object, right? So a type is not an object, it's just a description of an object, right? So this is a little bit weird. So the, and this is what I was saying in the last lecture about why I think the concept of the MPI data type is strange, because what it is is an object that describes a type. Mm -hmm. 
right, and C and C++ already have a type system. Right, so it would make more sense if the data type, the MPEG data type, was a real data type. Right? But, uh, but that's not how it works in, in MPI, um, for whatever reason. Uh, and there's a lot built up around these MPI data types. I'm going to try and give you a flavor today of, of how, you would, how you would effectively achieve what this line of code is trying to achieve. Um, as you said, there's more than one way to do this. Um, so, for example, we could, you know, here it's sort of easy enough. We could actually compute the size of this struct. Um, and we could, we could again, hand it into an MPI byte. So, in this particular example, we could do that. But let's say we didn't want to do that. We want to somehow tell MPI correctly what this thing was and have it actually do the communication. Um, so, we can help around this. This does not work. Um, so, let me give you an idea of the things that MPI has to be aware of. So it has to be aware of the fact that there's three elements in the struct. Um, it has to be aware of the type of each of the three elements. Um, it also has to know, or at least has to be able to compute, I should say, the address of each of these elements. The address of A, the address of B, and the address of B in the struct. Right. So, um, so it's, this is a little bit awkward from the standpoint of MPI. Because it has to know this information, but this information is highly machine dependent. Right? If I send this data structure, I don't know um, what the address, what the resulting address will be on the, the, the new computer that this message arrives on. Right? So it's a little bit strange to, um, to actually give this specific information uh, directly. So it just because it doesn't make a lot of sense. Right? Um, so what would make more sense um, is if we replace the addresses themselves with displacements. So suppose I thought of uh, address of A as being location zero, right? Then if I, I know the difference, these are two things are numbers, I can take their difference, right? And I can and I can report that information. And similarly I can do the same thing for um, for n to a. Um, Alright, so Basically, a derived data type is a collection of a uh, way to think of what a derived data type is. And what, 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 uh, an MPI derived data type is basically a collection of pairs, where each pair is an MPI data type and a displacement. And if you want to think about it, there's actually a, a, a caveat. I said MPI type. I'm not actually sure. I have to go check if it can really be any MPI type or if it has to be an MPI basic data type. Um, so I have to go check. But I, in fact, until I tell you otherwise, assume that it's a basic MPI data type. Um, and does anyone appreciate the distinction between that, that, whether it's basic or not? If you don't understand why I'm saying that, then it's a good, good thing to explain. So, all right. So, um, if it wasn't basic, then I could create a data type and then hand it to another data type. So, I can, if I had a, if it didn't say basic, it says what it says now. I can create a data type and then. Suppose that data type is embedded with another data type. I can now describe the new data type in terms of the old data type that I just built. But if I require that it's a basic thing, then I have to actually, for everything, I have to kind of branch down and go to all the basic things. Um, so it's, in fact, I, this might be one of the disadvantages of this technique. So I, I think it might actually be the case that it requires it being a basic MPI data type, or maybe even a standard. I, I kind of forget. Um, so let me get back to you guys on, on the result of that that's probably important to understand. Um, so so the picture I'd like you to have in your head for this is that imagine you have contiguous memory like this um, and then somewhere along here is A, B, and N and they have some width. Okay, so, um, so to give you a feeling for how you write code like this, um, what you're going to do is um, you're going to create a number of of things, right? So um, this this structure here, we're going to have store the length of the of the individual types. Um, then this is going to have that displacement I was just telling you about for the address. Um, and then and then this is of course going to tell us um, what the types of each individual thing are that we're going to send. Um, so initially, our block lengths will all be one, essentially always. And we'll set our type list to the two floats in the integer. 
before you dig into the details of this, I just wanted to ask a sort of uh, high level question about why we're doing this. Because, like, if you're assuming your machines are uniform in architecture, you wouldn't have to do this, right? Mm -hmm. Like, um, in the sense that you could just literally shove this truck through and use MPI byte times the size of the truck. So, it's a good question. So, the first answer to the question is that A, you may not have uniform sure, machines. Sure. That's probably more of the reality. I mean, actually, well, I should say it's. The intended reality of MPI, I think in practice, we usually work on a cluster with homogeneous architectures. Mm -hmm. um, that being said, um, you know, it, it may be impossible for you to actually know uh, in advance the, um, the actual structure itself. Right? So someone may provide you information like this. Right? So does that make sense? So, like, um, so someone may hand you a data type, yeah. and you don't know the internals of it, but they hand you this information. Oh, yeah. I see, I see. right. So, so and also like if the data type is not the basic as you assume, then you can have very complicated data type like yeah, combined, yeah, and then it would be very powerful. Right. Yeah, so that's my other question, which is, what if there's pointers in here? Can this? Can yeah, that's a really good question. So, um, so basically, you can't send pointers like that. I mean, you yeah, can, right? right? You can send a number, but it doesn't yeah. necessarily make any sense. Yeah, when I say send a pointer, I mean, they send a data as a pointer. Yeah, so this, this is a really good question. I think you've actually hit the nail on the head for um, for why I'm so critical of some of this stuff. Right? So it, it's that you have to do all this work, but you still don't really necessarily get the expressibility that you want. Right? Um, so, so of course, if you have a pointer, you, it's not that you really want to send the number that is the pointer, right? You want to send the thing that the pointer is pointing to, right? Right? And so, you know, that's a whole like sort of world of issues in terms of how you do this. Um, and I actually really encourage you guys, as you think about this stuff, to think about if you're, especially if you're like a, a CS person, to think about like how you might implement this more intelligently. Like, I, I've actually, in the back of my mind, I've always wanted to go to like one of these MPI implementation standards places and like, you know, propose that we change this to like use something more intelligent. I think it would be a lot better. It was, it was not exactly the way. It was. But anyway, I think this is it's not too hard to understand, uh, nevertheless, despite its limitations. Uh, so let's take a look. Um, so, um, so, of course, the first element, A, is going to be displaced at zero, right? And then what we want to do is we want to get um, other displacements. Um, well, okay, so A is not really at zero. We were initially calling it zero, right? We want to know what's A's um, displacement from wherever we're starting from. Um, and so, um, you can use this MPI address call to get this sort of information. Um, so we do this for, for B and N. Um, we compute the displacements uh, accordingly, right? Um, and I should say, um, what is this really doing? This is really taking the address of this thing, or just taking this thing as a pointer and setting it equal to that thing, uh, more or less. Right? So um, this is sort of a weird MPI call. It's not really absolutely necessary. Um, but it's, uh, nevertheless, I mean, that's defined in the standard, so I'm just showing you, showing you how it works. Um, all right, so then what you do is you call something like MPI type struct. This is uh, something I haven't explained to you yet, but I'm showing you now, um, where you take all the information we just computed over the past, like, 70 lines of code, and, and you create a type object. And then um, you, um, yeah. then you call this type commit with that type. And you might ask, why is this here? Um, this seems a little bit redundant. We have our type struct. Why do we need to commit it? Um, and actually, this is it's a little bit interesting. Um, <coughs> so I was reading about this earlier. So the reason why you commit it is because MPI in the standard allows the stand like allows the library to actually optimize the thing you just did. Right. So maybe there's somehow some intelligent thing it can do depending on the system that it can take all this information in the type struct, change it somehow, make it semantically the same, but make your communication faster by, by changing the internal to the struct. Um, so that's what type commit does, is it actually modifies that structure. Yeah? And what does the block allows be there? Um, good question. Let's go to the next slide. Let's we'll be on the next slide. Um, actually, it won't be on the next slide, so I'll tell you now. Um, cool. So um, what block lengths are, um, is that for, for each of the things, and so you have something that starts like some A, right? 
um, maybe you want to have many A's continuously right next to one another. So this is telling you how many, this is like sort of count from all the other things, but specific to the, the one thing in that position. Does that make sense? So like if I, so is that way? let me go back to this picture and I'll, so imagine here, I wanted to duplicate A a number of times. So it's something like an A to float, right? So imagine I want to have 10 floats here, followed by you know, 10 floats here, right? Followed by a million A's, right? So now I can say, um, you know, what did I say, 100 here? But if there's 100 A, 100 floats, then you, you, the first element of block range will be 100. Right? So it's telling you sort of how much continuous in that one spot and that type exists. Oh, so you have a prefix, for example, right. that two floats, so it would be two. And the type literally just yeah. the So that is a little bit inconvenient choice to always float twice, but um, so either imagine that they weren't the same type, um, or just appreciate that um, this thing is agnostic to whether or not that is true, whether or not they are all floats or not. Um, the system just doesn't care. But but yes, you're right. You could you could have um, strictly speaking, you could have uh, uh, a single displacement bit of information and then double the block count or something. Right? And that's the first argument that three has to be the amount of the type police, the size of the type police. Uh, yeah. So it's the number of things in the struct. Right? It's, the, it's basically the length of these arrays. Right? Um, okay, so I said this is the most general way to do this. Um, so it, it might be a little bit frustrating. Um, and so because uh, there's so much information you have to compile. It's, it's not actually terrible, but you know, maybe you want to do less work because you feel lazy. Um, so many times, like the way you have to do this, you know, it's going to be much more structured, right? So, um, so imagine, for example, you have an array and you want to slice out um, elements of it continuously, or sorry, non-continuously, but of equal space, right? So you have like the first element, and you have want to go, you know, plus n away, and then plus two n away, and then plus three n away, right? So MPI type vector is a call similar to MPI type struct, which assumes that that's what you're trying to do, and so requires sort of less of these parameters. Um, so MPI type continuous, um, it seems a little bit strange, but you know, it's a little redundant based on our conversation today, but, but it exists. So it's, if you have an array and you have contiguous entries of the array, you want to just take like a sub part of the array. You can use MPI type continuous. Now, now of course, you could just not use this at all, right? You could just, you know, kind of go for it with offsets and everything. Um, but, but this exists in the standard, nonetheless. Um, and, uh, and an MPI type indexed, um, so this is, again, a similar thing where you have an array, but you don't necessarily have uh, strides of any specific length, but you, you know what those strides are. So you know what the indices in the array are. Um, so you can use MPI type indexed and again, you need sort of less of this information. All right. Um, all right. So, so cool. So that's, that's sort of the part about derived data types that I wanted to say. And I, I want to briefly mention to you uh, an alternative to using derived data types with an MPI. Um, so, the alternative is um, you may explicitly copy, of course, non contiguous memory uh, to a contiguous location. Uh, so an example would be something like this. Um, so you have a pointer, like this A pointer, right? You have one of them and they're a float, right? And what you want to do is you want to um, basically copy it into some location in memory, some, some internal buffer, right? Um, and this position will be a pointer to the, to the end of that buffer. Um, so um, actually, sorry, it's not an internal buffer, it's the buffer you can Right. Um, so when you're, when the result of this call position will be sort of the end of this pack business, right? Um, and you can repeat this for all these other guys here, and then you can broadcast. And then there's a special type that I kind of lied to you about not having earlier, which is called MPI pack, which is, a, which is in fact a basic data type, um, which uh, allows you to sort of index into the, the buffer. Um, so the the signatures of pack and unpack are like this. Um, so, yeah. All right. So the question is, uh, so to end uh, the lecture, I guess. The question is, when do I use pack and unpack versus when do I use derived data types? 
Um, so the answer is it's usually better to use derived data types. Um, and the reason why that is is because you avoid copying, right? Of course, that's not always true. So I just said it's usually it's like with an asterisk, right? So it depends on your definition of the word usually, <laughs> right? Um, so do experiments between the two to, to really check. Uh, because, so what could happen is it could be faster somehow and could have a memory available to do the copy. Right? It becomes continuous and then the send is really fast. Versus you have non-continuous data, for example, um, that you didn't copy and, and so accessing it gets poor locality when you do all this magic. Right? So the send is maybe slower. Um, so it has to access all these various elements to get into the buffer. So, so, right, so I guess the message is sort of, you know, like kind of depends, but, but in most situations you could argue that derived data types should be faster. Um, but um, I think maybe more of a pain in the butt to work with. Um, cool. So that's the end of the slides for today. You um, have to like create one of these for every type of right. struct that you have in your code. Right. Actually, so you so, send it around. So you've provided me uh, something I wanted to say. So right. So this just seems really oppressively annoying, right? Um, and, and as I've been saying over and over again, you know. It's sort of like something that should be done by the compiler, right? right? Because you know, sometimes you can, these are all sort of things that are kind of easy to determine by context. Um, so it turns out that there's a library, which, which I'm going to show you uh, in this course, some of, uh, uh, which is, uh, who here writes C++ code? Okay, so everyone here knows what the standard template library is? Uh, okay, so there's something else on top of the standard template library that you may have heard of called Boost. Um, what Boost is, is it's like a, a group of people who really love writing C++ code, but they write these, uh, these STL-like libraries that eventually actually usually end up becoming the STL in future years. Um, I guess like C++ 11, much of the new functionality in the STL is really coming out of Boost. Um, uh, and basically, uh, someone has gone off and written a Boost MPI library. Um, and so what, what Boost MPI actually does is it actually takes a lot of the headache out of all this stuff out of MPI. So, um, so it, it makes it so that, for example, if you want to send an arbitrary object, you can always just call send. You can always just call receive. Right? You don't have to worry, you don't have to tell it what the data type is at all. Right? It'll just, it sort of does what I was saying. But it's not necessarily doing that send and receive efficiently, is the answer. But, but it, it gives you programmatic um, ability to make it more efficient. And, and there's a systematic way by which uh, everything becomes as efficient as it would have been if you were using C and MPI. Um, so, so I'm going to try and show you this sort of at the end of the course um, to the best of my ability. But, um, but I think it's important, nonetheless, to know about what is actually going on. Because otherwise, you couldn't, if it's not working or if you're not sure if it's necessarily working, knowing how this all works in C is, I think, important. Right? Um, anyway, so. Um, so cool. So that's all I have for today. Um, if you guys have any questions, feel free to hang out and talk to me. I think we still have. Oh, actually, we're on time, I guess, for today. Cool. So, great.